Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the TCRP Report T-174, Improving Safety Culture in Public Transportation. My name is Janeta, and I will be your operator for today. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. Later, we will be conducting a question and answer session. If at any time you require operator assistance, please press star followed by zero, and we will be happy to assist you. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. I will now like to turn the conference over to Lori Glickman. Please proceed. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. On behalf of the National Transit Institute, I thank you for participating in TCRP Report 174, Improving Safety Culture in Public Transportation Webinar. The National Transit Institute develops, promotes, and delivers training and education programs for the public transit industry in the United States. We are pleased to have our presenters today, Howard Roberts and Roger Tucson. Howard H. Roberts, Jr., who is the Principal Investigator Project Manager for TCRP Report 174, is currently the President of Harrier LLC. From 2010 to 2013, he was the Senior Vice President for Transit and Rail at Sam Schwartz Engineering, SSE, where he completed an Operations Assessment of Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transit Authority, which was extended to include an evaluation of Metro safety culture. Howard previously uh, was the president of New York City Transit from April 2007 to November 2009. At NYCT, he personally negotiated labor contracts and oversaw the first competitive, competitive negotiation of medical and prescription contracts and restructured the organization of the NYCT subway system for the first time in 100 years. He also aligned managerial responsibilities with key performance indicators to include the first ever writer report card. Howard also served in the U.S. Army from 1961 to 1981. He holds a Bachelor of Science from the United States Military Academy and a Master of Science in Engineering and a Master of Public Affairs from Princeton University. Roger Toussaint served as International Vice President and the Director of Strategic Planning for the Transport Workers Union of America until 2012. Prior to that, from 2001 to 2009, he served as President of the TWU Local 100, representing 38,000 employees in New York's public transportation sector, mostly at New York City Transit. Toussaint began his career at NYMTA as a transit cleaner, followed by becoming a track worker in 1985, a title he held until his retirement from the MTA in 2012. Roger was an officer at the International Transport Federation of the International Confederation of Trade Unions. He served on the Executive Council of the Coalition of Black Trade Unions, CBTU, as a trustee for the New York City Employee Retirement System and several other retirement and health funds. He attended St. Mary's College in Trinidad and Tobago, Brooklyn College, and AIRCO Technical Institute in New York, and currently resides in Atlanta, Georgia. The webinar format consists of Howard and Roger presenting their material, followed by a question and answer session. You can participate in the discussion by hitting star 1 on the phone at the designated time, or by using the chat pod that is located in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. If you have not already printed out a copy of the presentation that was emailed to you, you can click on the handout document in the upper left-hand corner of your screen. You can also email Barbara Van Dyke at bvandyke, V-A-B, v-a-n-d-y-k-e at nti.rutgers.edu, and she will be glad to assist you. I will now turn the presentation over to Howard. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, John F. Kennedy once said, uh, when asked by a little boy, how did you become a war hero? Uh, Kennedy replied, it was absolutely involuntary. They sank my uh, boat. And that's basically what happened to Roger and uh, me. Uh, I got back to the Transit Authority for my second tour, this time as president, on the 7th. On the 24th, I got one of the calls in the middle of the night. Uh, Danny Boggs, a 14-year-old veteran, had been hit by a train near 59th Street uh, Columbus Circle Station while setting up flags. Uh, I was on my way to Danny Boggs' wake uh, on a Sunday when I got another call uh, saying that uh, Track worker Marvin Franklin, a 22-year veteran, had been hit by a Queenstown train while moving equipment at Boyd Shimmerhorn Station. Uh, his partner, Jeff Hill, uh, was to survive critical injuries but never, uh, never worked again. Uh, Roger and I embarked on a, uh, uh, a K-1 
campaign to solve those problems at New York City Transit, and uh, that ultimately uh, led us to uh, safety culture uh, as being one of the primary uh, generators of those uh, accidents. Uh, and then that led us to uh, cooperate on uh, writing CCRP Report 174 about improving safety culture in public transportation. Uh, 174 has probably the most comprehensive literature review of safety culture ever done. Uh, we looked at safety culture within uh, public transportation. We did a number of many uh, case studies. We looked at safety culture in organizations outside public tra transportation. Uh, we looked at uh, the definition and key components. Uh, we covered methods and tools for assessing where you are with your safety culture. We looked at key performance indicators, best practices, uh, and then we looked at four major uh, case studies at four different uh, agencies. And finally, uh, we came up with uh, some guidelines for improving safety culture. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. This is Roger. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Roger Tutra. Uh, so the best definition that we um, came up with to suggest was um, an ad adaptation of Utah's definition, which we find found to be most functional and communicable, yet it was sufficiently encompassing for public transportation situations and for safety practitioners. So I caution everyone that this is part science and part art. Science derived from the extracting the data from the various studies, as well as art in terms of how we communicate. So I'll read the definition that you see in front of you, just to get things going. Safety culture is shared value, what is important to all public transportation employees who are delivering safe, efficient revenue service, and shared beliefs and attitudes how the transportation system works and what individual employees' role should be that interact with employees, safety policies, procedures, and rules to produce behavioral norms, which is the way we do our jobs, whether we are being observed or not. That is the suggested definition we came up with. Next. Our There are uh, very series of models in the, in the literature. Uh, in the report, we covered uh, nine. Uh, probably the most uh, popular is uh, Reason's model. And uh, Reason talks about uh, uh, essentially having four subcultures that add up together into an informed culture or a safety culture. Uh, these four subcultures are a reporting culture. That means that everything that happens is recorded and uh, is known by everyone. Uh, a learning culture means that it, uh, the organization isn't uh, uh, hidebound and stuck in the past. It's willing to learn uh, everything it can from its experience. A flexible culture means that it's willing to make the changes uh, that it sees uh, as indicated from what it's learned. And finally, and, uh, and uh, just as important as the other three, is a just culture. And that means that all the people in the organization understand that employees will be treated uh, justly in uh, every, uh, every instance. Uh, a uh, improvement, in, in a certain extent, uh, Nuclear uh, plants uh, uh, felt that uh, perhaps that uh, uh, the reason uh, uh, model uh, needed to be uh, buffered a little bit uh, to deal with the, uh, the, the fact that failure could be a, a gigantic uh, uh, escape of uh, radioactive material. Uh, so under the high reliability organization model, there's a tremendous preoccupation with failure. People are always looking 
uh, or the uh, you know for a failure that's just right around the corner. There's a reluctance to simplify interpretations uh, uh, because sometimes when you simplify, you skip over a potential uh, uh, major error. There's a sensitivity to operations. Uh, there's a commitment to resilience. And uh, one of the most important elements is the deference to expertise. Uh, if you have the, the CEO and then you have the guy that actually uh, runs the reactor, uh, you uh, defer to the guy who runs the uh, reactor in uh, 99 times out of 100. That all adds up to mindfulness about your situation. That equals the capability to discover and manage unexpected events. Uh, and that leads to uh, high reliability. Uh, what, Roger, what you have, yeah, what you have in front of you is a mixture of large, medium, and relatively small systems um, on both coasts, which the CCRP 174 um, conducted case studies on. Uh, so what we're going to talk about today is, uh, is the NYCT rail system. Okay, so the next four slides are going to talk about um, the system at New York City Transit. Um, and here are some, some data which we, that is relevant to examining the the safety culture problem. First, on the complexity of the system. You have the numbers up in front of you. I'll just point out that those, um, that those numbers can be adjusted for 2015. You have higher ridership numbers, higher average weekly, weekday numbers. Now, you have an additional station, an additional track mile. Just note that um, the track miles, the revenue miles, um, if you were to consider non-revenue miles, it would be 840 um, non-revenue non miles. Hello? Um, the next slide looks at employee fatalities by decade. Um, available records begin in 1946 to 1949. The indication here is that there was a high level of fatalities in the 40s and 50s. A downward trend has been occurring since that time with a spike in the 1980s, and that spike is due to a move from breakdown maintenance at New York City Transit to the reconstruction of the entire subway and, in fact, also the surface system and, and the associated push for productivity and for getting work done. Um, the in 1988 to 2007, you can see the, um, the indication here. Um, this, these are the figures up to the commencement of the program that we instituted following the 2007 double fatality. Uh, so the causes of the fatalities from 1988 to 2007 are indicated up there. Just to clarify, the, the um, two conductors struck by objects outside the train, that would be referring to, um, to station column. Next. Howard. Okay. Uh, the, I, I, I'm not sure who's, like, some, somebody is moving the, uh, the slides, and uh, it would be better if uh, if the person who was talking at the time uh, did that. Uh, the first incident that we had with track fatalities uh, shortly after I returned to the Transit Authority uh, happened uh, near uh, 66 between 66th Street Station and 59th Street uh, Station. Now, at, at the time this took place, uh, there was no hard and fast uh, surrender of the uh, of the uh, of the uh, of the track, and so uh, track number two, which I'm showing with the green uh, pointer here, or trying to, uh, track number two 
uh, was supposed to uh, get out, be taken out of service uh, for work to be done on it. Uh, and uh, uh, a, uh, with the employees standing around, a work train passed uh, through on the way to the site of the work. Uh, and uh, so uh, uh, at this point in time at uh, the PA, uh, the employee's primary method of knowing the track was clear was when the work train went by. Uh, unfortunately, uh, shortly thereafter, there was an unexpected event uh, at, uh, uh, at uh, 66th Street Station. Uh, there was a stalled uh, train, uh, and uh, the uh, uh, the, uh, the stalled train meant that the, uh, uh, which is on the local track, meant that the uh, control center uh, rerouted a local train back onto the express track, onto track two, which is the track which uh, uh, the uh, employees uh, down at 59th Street uh, were under the impression was now out of uh, out of service. Uh, what uh, what uh, then uh, happened uh, is uh, Danny Boggs was uh, crossing the uh, uh, the track number two with his partner. Uh, he was hit and uh, and uh, and killed. Roger. The next four slides. Um, looks at the uh, Marvin Franklin fatality, which occurred, which occurred at Hoyt and Skimhorn Street Station in, in Brooklyn. So just to describe what you're looking at here, this slide um, has five names on it, London, Hill, Franklin, Williams, and Baker. The, the dolly with the arrow at the top of your slide is, um, is, a, is that, it's not a name. That's a real dolly. Um, so just to um, explain, so you have a multi-track subway section of, of um, a multi um, a multi-track system here, a sharp curve in the approach to the work site. There were no caution lights set up. Um, the employees were working in the no clearance area between platforms. There was no lighting except for ambient lighting um, from the station uh, platform nearby. Um, there was no um, third rail protection, um, and the task involved was moving the breaking that two-piece dolly um, that you see at the top of the slide, breaking that apart, and uh, moving it over to the position where employee named Baker was situated at um, two tracks away at the edge of the station platform. Um, and the area just beyond the station platform. So just to understand here, that means that there were a host of violations and unabated hazards, which had become routine, um, maintenance of way workers routinely on a daily basis navigated these hazards with skill, but for the intervening factors that, um, that occurred that evening that night, which collided with, um, with this routine. The next slide, you see that, um, that employees, um, um, Hill and Franklin, begin to move one piece of the dolly across the track, um, while the supervisor, London, with a, with a, using a strobe, handheld strobe flashlight, um, is looking for for, um, for approaching train. Next slide. Um, Supervisor London moves away from, from his position looking for approaching train and moves over to help London, help William um, move the second piece of the dolly over to the um, to over to Baker, um, so that Franklin and Hill and Hill, who are now on the um, on a, on a, on the track 
move in the first week of the early are completely unprotected, um, with no warning, no caution, and at regular speed. A train then enters the area they were work they were working and strikes, um, struck Franklin and Hill, killing Franklin and in severely injuring Hill. Our the immediate action that we took, we halted all the emergency track work from April 30th to May 10th in order to conduct safety stand down, and we added a labor representative to the two boards of inquiry. Uh, prior to this time, labor had been always on the outside of the tent uh, looking in. That frequently led to conflict over findings uh, by making a labor rep part of the board of inquiry. Uh, we uh, we managed to bring labor uh, inside the uh, inside the tent. Uh, the board of inquiry findings on the box of the property uh, were procedures did not require the person securing the general order limits to verify that the rail control center had surrendered the track, and employees were not required to get rail control center okay for accessing the right of way. The Board of Inquiry results in the Franklin fatality um, um, reflected from the major findings were what you see in front of you. Employees reported at different locations. Um, this was an accident essentially waiting to happen. Um, but more than anything else, uh, the findings spoke to the culture that was evident in the maintenance of a section of, tra of the track and the track department. Now I should note here that we did not wait for attention, uh, for the attention to the matter and to the sense of urgency among employees. We did not wait for, the, for those to fade away, but in fact we moved to capture it. Um, and, and by that I mean that we, you would normally have board of inquiry findings released um, long after, many months, even a year or so after an incident, um, in order to let things die down. We actually thought that was disingenuous and we moved immediately to, uh, to move the board of inquiry around. Um, in addition to the immediate measures that Howard indicated here, we actually undertook a broad, comprehensive response um, which drove to the heart of what was going on based based on um, um, identifying what, the, what best practices were on, uh, on attacking the problem from all sides. Um, um, the indication in the middle here is that we also sought outside help from professional and professional sources uh, to conduct focus groups and studies um, and surveys. Um, and the, 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 the thing to point out here is um, it is often said that you cannot fix, um, fix a problem of culture from the same state of consciousness that produced it, that you often have to go outside in order to be able to fully and properly um, and in, and address, it, address the culture problems and systemic problems in an in-depth manner. Yeah, so we also undertook some, some short-term short changes in order to, to arrest any, um, any further incident. Um, the Rail Control Center, the RTC, was given um, complete authority so that there would be no confusion, no confusion over, um, over where the authority for permission to get on the track and get off the track lay. Um, uh, employees were, the employees who were um, securing the track, um, once it is, once service was ended, will now to be required to be in direct con contact with the rail control center, um, rather than how it was in the past, where they were relying upon second-hand information as to whether service had in fact ended or was still going on or had been somehow delayed. Um, supervisors as well were now um, required to uh, to be in the, the supervisor on site. That is, 
was now required to be in direct contact with the rail control center rather than the way it was before where it was often um, the supervisor to whom the general order was issued um, and that person might be in some remote office communicating with the supervisor on site. Um, further, we identify the problem of adjacent track flagging as one of the major concerns um, uh, for track fatality. Uh, so what we did here is that we actually redefined what an adjacent track meant pre previously for the purposes of flagging. Previously, an adjacent track meant that literally the track had to be just adjacent to the, to the track on which work was being performed. Here we defined it as, 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 as adjacent for the purposes of flagging that it, that it, it, it has, had to have been set adjacent track to work area cannot be separated by a physical barrier. If it, is, if it is not separated by a physical barrier such as a solid wall or station platform, then it must be flagged as well as train operators were required to slow once they detect the presence of employees um, even on an adjacent track, and even if there are no flags on their track. Um, uh, um, next, the, the, issue, the problem of noise impairing the detection of train movement on tracks um, around which work was being performed was also identified as a major problem, and we um, we instituted the measures indicated above there um, to, to deal with that problem. Frequently, uh, employees seeing a train um, would be confused that as to whether there was a there was a tra other trains present in the area, including on the tracks upon which they were working. Finally, we um, we instituted short-term measures changes with respect to emergency alarm boxes and telephones, which are situated on uh, five to 700 feet throughout the subway system at New York City Transit. This was a heat, turned out to be a huge problem. There were inoperable emergency telephones and alarm uh, boxes all, of, all over the system, and not in, not in a handful, but in the hundreds. Um, yet work was routinely being performed um, at or near these boxes regardless. The uh, Joint Track Safety Task Force, we established that on May 15, 2007, and it was chaired by the Head of System Safety, uh, Cheryl Kennedy. The questions that we posed to this task force uh, or to what extent are rural procedures being ignored? Is risk taking inherent in the maintenance of weight culture? Uh, have measures taken following previous fatalities changed the culture and employee behavior? Uh, what, up, up to this point in time, all the fatalities have been treated as sort of a one-off, and uh, the investigation has only focused on that one fatality. What we asked the Joint Track Safety Task Force to do was look at the uh, at the pattern over the last uh, 20 years and see what they could learn from uh, what happened and then what was done about it and whether that was effective. Uh, the last two questions were, is the workforce fully invested in the safety mission and what short and long-term uh, changes uh, uh, do we need to make to prevent uh, uh, track uh, fatalities from reoccurring. So we developed an extensive employee survey, which I'll explain in detail later on. Um, I'll just point out here that, um, that this survey was developed in June. The fatalities occurred at the end of May. Just to underline, underscore the, the point that we moved rapidly to um, to why we had the attention and the sense of urgency among the employees. Uh, so the survey 
um, was, as I said, was quite extensive. 756 telephone interviews were conducted. Um, the interviews, each of them required 37 minutes. So that's a considerable commitment of time um, on the, required on the part of the employee. And um, the 95% at the bottom of the screen would indicate a relatively high level of, um, of confidence in the outcome of the uh, of the survey, or what the survey tells us. Next, um, this is a sample of of of, uh, of, the, of this survey, and I'll just point out that this, that this, again, the survey was 105 questions, so there was a huge amount of uh, um, questioning to capture every variance in the in people's thinking. But as this sample asks an interesting question of would you say your fellow workplace, your, your fellow employees, workplace rules, your fellow? No, no, you, under, this is you. This is what would yes. you say. Would you, you say that work safety rules? Right. Would you say that you follow workplace safety rules very closely, somewhat closely? Um, and interestingly enough, employees generally rate themselves high for adherence uh, to safety. On the other hand, when the same question was asked of, of, of co-workers, how closely would you say workplace safety rules are followed by your co-workers? Um, generally, employees indicated here that their, their co-workers were following safety rules poorly. Um, and intuitively, that suggests that uh, that that's how co-workers would actually view the person answering this question as well. Uh, we found that to be very interesting. Um, the next slide asks the question of how much of a factor are the following in making it hard to follow all the safety rules? That is expression that gets work done, that workers don't always think of the dangers, that track workers want to, um, want to get off the tracks or train operators want to get off the trains as quickly as possible. And generally what you see from this is that the highest, the factor that, high, that influences um, the people's um, adherence to see through the most were, were all pressures related to getting the job done and, and going home or going back to the crew. Um, the next slide asks the question regarding um, how, regarding um, employees reporting near misses. And this is an extremely important um, issue for us and for obvious reasons. And most employees experience near misses, have experienced near misses as well as most employees, most near misses are actually, were actually not reported. The, uh, the reasons that uh, were given uh, were, uh, uh, th these were the, uh, the four major ones. Nobody hurt or killed, no harm, no foul. Afraid of discipline, get co-worker in trouble. Afraid of losing job. Uh, this was one of the most disturbing findings in the, uh, in the survey. Uh, because a near miss uh, to a transit authority is actually a gift from God. Uh, it, uh, what, what a near bus generally shows is you've got some kind of uh, flaw or vulnerability in your armor, and uh, it uh, could have led to uh, significant casualties, and uh, it didn't. Uh, but once you have a near miss, you need to fix that flaw. You need to fix that vulnerability. Uh, but if it is never reported, uh, then uh, it's uh, going to hang out there until uh, uh, the near miss becomes a, uh, a hit and you have uh, fatality. Next, we tested the effectiveness of the communications being utilized at the New York City Transit. And what we found was from the survey, was that it was on a healthy, high level of dissatisfaction among employees with respect to how safety rules and safety information was being communicated. 
actually from my own experience, it was very common um, when employees were sent to review videos and film footage that once the lights go off, people, you know, there were, there were people that would um, just go to the back of the room and use it for those times, indicating that they did not believe that um, that the that the that what they were being taught was was very meaningful or life and death towards their own health. Our uh, task force reviewed uh, the numerous previous safety initiatives, the uh, Board of Inquiry reports for fatal accidents over the past 10 years, the effectiveness of pre previous safety stand down, uh, joint labor management inspections of track construction maintenance projects, APTA standards, previous audits, and uh, we also looked at the feasibility of using water warning or alerter uh, devices. Uh, the Joint Track Safety Task Force came up with 63 recommendations, 13 rule changes, 50 procedure changes, and they were grouped in the uh, seven areas uh, shown uh, on uh, this slide. Uh, Roger? Yeah, so we conducted um, extensive track safety stand downs. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with what a stand down is, um, at least in the maintenance of your track department, is essentially where you stop everything except emergency work or where you summon all employees um, into a um, different training module uh, at the same time on the same subjects, on the same material. So the track safety stand on was conducted in three parts. The first part was, um, w was for maintenance of way employees. There are essentially um, four large groups of maintenance of employees at New York City Transit, encompassing about 7,000 plus employees. Those departments are the track department, the power department, sorry, the track department, the line equipment signals department, the infrastructure department, um, and, the, and the power department. Thank you. Um, so we conducted an eight-hour stand-down, full day, um, and interestingly, it was broken into a two-hour auditorium session conducted by both Howard and myself, and then a six-hour small group instruction on rule changes um, that uh, in this first, the first stand-down encompassed almost 8,000 uh, people, as indicated here. Um, so what you're talking here is a considerable investment of time and resources, but most importantly is, um, is the top, very top leadership of both organizations who heavily invested in the process in a demonstrable manner. Um, the other things to note is that hourly employees, supervisors, and management employees all participated in the same class on an equal footing and also that the training was conducted jointly by two instructors. Each class was, was um, training was conducted by two instructors who had been trained for the purposes of, uh, of, this, of these classes. Um, the second and third um, stand-downs involved rapid transit operating employees. That would be train operators and conductors and then employees involved in various aspects of capital program man management. Combined those, um, th this training was um, less than a full day training um, and captured um, almost um, 7,000 employees. Uh, so what you have here is a, a total of close to 15,000 employees um, trained, again, a considerable investment of time and resources. What we found here is that um, um, the, 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 the principal problem that we were bumping up against was the culture of what is referred to in maintenance of way at New York City Transit as get it and go. Um, and the challenge was how to undo that, um, that type of cul that culture and how to replace it with a more healthy attitude towards actual adherence to real safety.
hours. Uh, the, the message that uh, we uh, got out to employees and, and emphasized and emphasized uh, over again was every employee has to be actively involved in safety. Uh, if an employee needs, uh, sees a need for a rule change and, and can't get that rule change, you would basically conclude you don't have a safety culture uh, because you're not listening uh, to uh, your uh, frontline employee. Rules and procedures on paper have no impact unless employees live those rules at all times. Uh, the two people killed in these two incidents were both long service employees. They had been down uh, on, the, on the tracks for a very long time, and, and part of what we concluded was uh, they were just getting comfortable down there. Normally, you'd expect the rookies to be the ones that uh, got in trouble, uh, but frankly, the rookies, uh, uh, you know, just uh, remained uh, scared for, uh, for a very long period of time, unfortunately. Uh, not uh, not long enough in uh, the, some cases. And finally, managers and supervisors, primary duty is to keep those who work for them out of harm's way. So the, the get it and go culture at New York City Transit was um, reinforced by a model of a model that essentially um, adopted rules and enforced them whether they were right or wrong and simply wrote people up. Um, and this is what uh, employees had become accustomed to. And we thought through all various programs instituted after these fatalities to institute a new, to structure a new approach to safety that was um, highly collaborative and required a buy-in and investment on all sides um, and a very candid, um, an atmosphere that would allow very candid discussion of, um, of the of safety problem. Um, so the, the challenge um, was having how to, how to identify and adopt good solid rules in which everyone was invested and in figuring out how to keep behavior in compliance with those, um, with those rules. Once the rules actually made sense and people had, um, had participated in actually um, I get, um, developing those rules. Underlying principle is wherever possible, um, you engineer out the risk rather than simply tell people to work safely. Um, or simply rely or simply rely on discipline in order to um, in order to uh, create a safe environment. Um, and finally, here um, the importance of building in multiple layers of safety, um, just in case you're figuring out where just you figure out where all the lapses are that could occur, and you factor and you factor for them. Uh, The primary engines of change uh, in the, the New York City example uh, were that union and management leadership personally addressed every employee at Lent about uh, the leadership of uh, both management and unions' commitment to track safety. Uh, we increased the amount of flagging uh, and we slowed down trains accordingly. Uh, interestingly enough, we didn't slow them down enough that it showed up as a deterioration in on-time uh, performance. And finally, something we stole from Con Edison, the large uh, electric utility in New York, was we directed uh, an appeal uh, to employees and more particularly their families. Think about your family. Come home safely at the end of every shift that you work uh, until you retire. Uh, Bruce Clark, a uh, famous Army general once uh, uh, said uh, uh, organizations only do well the things that their uh, commanders uh, check. Uh, so uh, what we set up were joint uh, system safety and TWU uh, site inspections. 
They will unannounce uh, three shifts. Uh, the, the checklist uh, included 21 areas. Uh, they covered track construction, maintenance, cleaning, flagging, uh, signal maintenance, and lightning. And then the weekly report by these joint uh, management uh, union teams were reviewed by both uh, Roger and uh, myself. Uh, when we first started this, May to August of 2007, there were 109 inspections, 225 unsatisfactory findings, and that averaged just a little bit over two unsatisfactory findings per inspection. Uh, from the February, however, to May 2008, we did 124 inspections, had 125 unsatisfactory findings, uh, for a uh, total of just above one uh, unsatisfactory finding per inspection. Roger? Yeah. Yeah. So the process that we that we described here so it required a power steering, but it was at the same time deeply collaborative um, and. Um, and was based on the highest level of commitment, um, some commitment at the highest level of both organizations, um, based on testing for the outcomes uh, as we went along and calibrating the rules, a willingness to adopt uh, just rules um, as, I, as problems were identified. Uh, the the results of our efforts uh, uh, turned out to be very uh, significant. Uh, three years, less two days after Marvin Franklin's, Franklin's death, a track supervisor was killed on the NYCT tracks, which represented the second longest period between track deaths in recorded New York history. Uh, six years, less five days after Marvin Franklin's death, uh, another hourly employee was killed on the track at NYCT. This is by far the longest period in history between uh, hourly worker uh, deaths. Uh, in our uh, way of calculating, uh, we were losing uh, an average of one employee a year on the track uh, before we initiated uh, this uh, program, uh, and then we went uh, Six years uh, without a uh, six years without a, uh, a fatality. Uh, a few suggestions that that we have for other transit authorities: make employee involvement your highest priority. Stress the fact that near miss reporting is critical to disaster prevention, and use surveys to determine what percentage of your near misses are not being reported. And then finally. Uh, consider adoption of the HRO model uh, because prolonged success makes uh, complacency uh, the, uh, the greatest danger. Uh, TCRP concluded uh, with uh, the following guiding principles, and these principles came out and repeatedly came out of everything that we uh, that we uh, that we did. They came, they came out of the many case studies. They came out of the major case study. They came out of the literature. Uh, and to have safety culture, what you need is strong leadership, and that's on both sides of the table, management and union. You've got to employ union shared ownership and involvement in your safety program. Communication, communication, communication. If something, ha anything that happens related to safety has got to be gotten out to everybody in the organization. Organizational learning, uh, you know, whatever happens in your, in your organization, you have to learn for it and learn from it and adjust. Uh, reporting uh, and near miss reporting in, in particular. Uh, also, uh, when, you're, uh, when you have incidents, uh, you should, the primary basis or purpose of the investigation should be preventing uh, a repeat, not simply disciplining employees. And then recognition and, and reward for safety behavior. And finally, and most important, a high level of mutual trust. 
Uh, employees have to trust supervisors. Uh, employees and supervisors have to trust trust managers, and that needs to be uh, that needs to be uh, uh, reciprocated up and down the line. Uh, as far as steps to improve safety culture, uh, we recommend first getting preliminary commitment from everyone uh, that something needs to uh, be done. Uh, the second step is collective problem identification. Uh, get everybody together and figure out what the problems are. Uh, you need to do an evaluation of your current uh, safety culture. and. And uh, there are different ways to do this, but we think a survey is the best. Uh, you need to develop a joint roadmap and, and get the resources committed uh, to uh, implement that roadmap. You've got to get employee buy-in. You can come up with the greatest program in the world, and if you haven't reached out to employees, and if they don't buy into the process, uh, then uh, you've, got, uh, you've got nothing. Uh, you've got an outreach input and roadmap for your vision as you go along. Just because it seemed like a great uh, program when you started doesn't mean that you don't need to learn as you go along and adjust accordingly. Uh, you need to ensure that management union leadership deliver on their uh, commitments. And finally, continuous feedback. Feedback, 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 adjust, adjust, adjust. Uh, we are, that concludes our uh, presentation. We'd be very happy to take uh, questions. Uh, if anybody wants to follow up uh, after uh, the webinar has been concluded, uh, we have both Rogers and my uh, contact information uh, on, the, uh, on this uh, last slide. Uh, operator? Ladies and gentlemen, if you have a question, please press star followed by one on your phone. If your question has been answered or you would like to withdraw your question, press star followed by two. Questions will be taken in the order received. Please press star one to begin. Your first question comes from the line of Asim Scott. Please proceed. Uh, yes, uh, I am um, safety manager and um, driver trainer at uh, a bus station here in um, Asheville, North Carolina. And I, I get, uh, came in um, not really um, thinking that there would be that much similarity, but there's an incredible amount of, um, of information that I got um, to use. Our problem right now here in Asheville Transit is really working with the union and trying to connect that whole piece of the safety culture where it's completely like a circle. Um, we just are trying to get that piece together, so that's where we are now. So I wanted to know if you had any ideas in terms of connecting with the union in a much more balanced way. Roger, uh, do you want to uh, answer first or uh, shall I? Well, I can I can touch on it. We can bounce this back and forth. Um, but um, you should know that prior to what we described here in 2007, um, the union, of course, in at New York City Transit, was has always been very passionate about about safety and the need for changes and so forth. Um, and as well, management has long has had a long declared similar passion. Um, but, you know, curiously enough, nothing really got off the ground in terms of the type of collaborative approach that you're attempting to do until this occurred, in to, in, until 2007. And um, it was not just the double fatality, but it was the demonstrable commitment that, um, that, was, that was clear on management side to turn the corner on the issue. Um, by, I mean, I say demonstrable. I mean, Howard um, immediately shut the system down. We were not going to, we were not going to have another funeral that we could avoid. Um, so that, um, and, and, and I described from there to um, giving the union a full place at the table um, and and in a real manner, listening to what the union was saying, um, 
as well as being able to, to commit to the resources required, you know, to train 10,000 people for almost eight hours, and not something you can get easy approval for. That, again, re reflects very high level of commitment. So some of the ingredients um, is, are, are very difficult to come by, I would say. The ingredients I described there, because obviously all the systems are under pressure to keep to keep um, to, uh, to keep service. Um, so you know, I'd be more than happy to bounce some ideas off with you. You have my number there. Um, I can get some more details of um, how your particular problems um, are with dealing with the union and getting the union on the table. How that could be uh, improved. Yeah, what I what I you know find is that a lot of times uh, you know the past in the past conflict uh, is a real uh, is a real barrier to uh, uh, to uh, cooperation and everybody's always already rem always remembering and smarting from whatever the uh, the guy on the other side did to them uh, before. But if there if there are two areas. Uh, in which uh, management and the union should always agree. Uh, those are safety and and training. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, I don't think uh, you know you never find management uh, saying that uh, we don't need to be uh, we don't need to be safe. Uh, you'll never find the uh, the union obviously uh, saying the uh, saying the same. But uh, what I always find is that it helps if uh, senior uh, uh, leaders on both sides can get out of the formal meeting places and you know have breakfast uh, together uh, on a on a regular uh, basis or uh, a uh, you know meet after work or uh, or whatever. But uh, you know, not get get away from the formal situations, which uh, sort of uh, demand uh, sometimes uh, some antagonism, and 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 just look for you know common ground. Look for ideas. Uh, I, I know a lot of union leaders that, uh, uh, particularly back at the TA in the early '80s, uh, were absolutely shocked the first time I asked them what they thought about something. Uh, because uh, you know they uh, that was a uh, that was a new experience for them, and and to managers I say look, you still get to decide. All right, uh, you are you are the decision maker in the organization. That doesn't mean that you can't listen to all viewpoints, uh, and uh, and base your decision on as much input as you possibly can get. Uh, so. Uh, you know, call up your uh, union counterpart and uh, uh, suggest uh, that uh, you know you guys need to breakfast somewhere. I mean, I would also say that you have to do things differently from how the way that you've been doing it in terms of how you approach union, union management, management union cooperation, because obviously the way that you have been approaching it has not worked from what you're indicating here. Um, so I would I would underline doing things, approaching things differently, doing it differently, and the more difficult the problem, the bolder you have to, have to be in terms of how you how you approach it differently. Right. Well, thank you. You're very welcome. Are there any other questions? We have no further questions on the line. Okay. Um. Do you want to say anything in closing, Roger Howard? No, I I think not. Not not for me. Okay. I'm good. I'm good again. Just on the line, that our uh, phone numbers are there and email addresses. And Great, it is on the screen, and um, there also, uh, I believe that appears at the end of the handouts that everybody has, so everyone should have a copy of that. Uh, I guess that's it. I would like to thank everyone for participating in this webinar. A special thank you to Howard Roberts and Roger Toussaint for their informative presentation. Just as a reminder to everyone, you will be receiving an invitation to fill out an evaluation for this event. Um, we, and he, I greatly appreciate your feedback, so if you could uh, complete that and send it in, that would be great. You should get that via email in the very near future.
Uh, thank you, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes today's conference. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect. Have a great day.